I would introduce the last speaker of this session, uh, Dr. Adelan Battari. Uh, Dr. Battari is a specialist in instrumentation with extensive background in environment, nuclear, and medical industry, industries. He has been involved in numerous international projects, uh, focuses on industrial odor impact assessment. He uh, is the founder of Centroid, the world leader in odor measurement and their sampling equipment. Your presentation is uh, entitled, uh, okay, Enhancing Budi uh, 1340 grid method via infield of photometry to obtain complex, complete odor impact assessment. But the title is not in the program? It's ah, it's not safe. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, the title of my uh, speech is a little bit different than what is in your program because we couldn't pull all the data together to support that research in time. But this is another one that I think it's actually really interesting and uh, you'll find it quite useful. So we heard a lot about the different assessments and uh, the traditional one is going to be source testing, olfactometric analysis and air dispersion modeling. There is some issues which we talked about a lot, I don't need to focus on, and being the synergy of the odors and the background odors. But sometimes, even not considering those issues, it's not possible to use this model alone to do a refinery or, a, let's say, a landfill, municipal landfill. Why? Because there is no source to take. In a refinery, there is thousands of sources. And no matter what you do, you will not capture them all. In a, in a landfill, in a municipal landfill, where do you want to put that flux chamber? Do you put it on top of a diaper and get like 1 million odor readings? Do you put it on a piece of plastic and get 10 odor readings? Do you put it 50 times, 100 times? So the emission rate really cannot be determined. So for these industries, this is what I'm focusing on. I'm not saying this method doesn't work. In a wastewater treatment plant, this method works and they have been using it and it has some drawbacks, but more or less we can get a good picture. But for a refinery, less. So there is another way and this one has been developed in Germany for some time and it's called the grid method or field inspection where you come from. It's based on a standard VDI 3940 and basically this is not using any source testing, any dispersion modeling. You're going to the site, to where the complaints are, and you're drawing out a grid, something like that. The numbers are just the identification of each grid. So in each position, you make measurements on each grid position. The measurement is, and I think we had somebody yesterday talking about this, that you stand there for 10 seconds, uh, 10 minutes. And every 10 seconds, you take out, actually it was Professor Gao, I remember now. You take out your mask, you sniff the air, and you say, do I smell something or I don't smell something? If out of that 10 minutes, six of those readings, being six, uh, 10%, are yes, I do smell the plant, you consider that an odor episode. So you say on that day, there were odors, if there were more than 10%. If it's 9%, that's okay. There were no orders. So you write this out, and you do this over a period of time. The German standard says six months. You don't have to do it every day. You have to do 52 measurements in total, but uh, it will take six months or one year. And you get something like this. What does this tell you? Like the one above, shows how many times you went to each node and you smelled something. So in that square, for example, it says on the top left-hand side, it says two. So that means on the nodes that they visited, two times they went there out of 52 times, or, or 13, I guess, per node. Out of 52 times on that square, they did smell something. And there is, in German law, about order hours, meaning how many percentage of time they can go there and smell something. But there is one issue. It doesn't say how much they smell something. Was it a little bit? Was it a lot? It's identification. If they identify the, la uh, the factory, then it's that factory and you get some number and you can uh, proceed to count that as an episode. 
The other issue is it's difficult to correlate this with dispersion modeling, something we'll talk about a bit later. So we, pro do, uh, we propose an addition to this method. The method is good. It does provide you with some useful information if you have uh, the resources to run such a long campaign. But it's not enough. There is something missing. What's missing is the other parts of the FIDOL, which is frequency, intensity, duration, offensiveness, and location. Well, we need to know the how much it smells, not just if it smells. So we develop an odor patrol. Now, the odor patrol, before there was one guy, and he went there and he smelled. Now, there are three of them. One, he's doing the same job he did before. He's going there, smelling the air every 10 seconds, and putting a yes or no. But there are two other guys that are following him. And these two guys are running an SM100 field olfactometer, and they are measuring the odor concentration on a period of every minute or every two minutes. I think by now most of you are familiar with what this instrument is. So it's a portable field olfactometer. It works very similar to a lab. It pulls the air in and uh, dilutes it. And based on the same principle of dilution, produces an odor concentration. But it's a personal one for that panelist. So our uh, patrollers go out there and they fill out a form like this where they have 60 samples of yes or no, and they have, let's say, 10 per each person of odor concentration. What do we do with that? We take the average of the two panelists, and we call it for that day they went the odor concentration. We also measure the difference between the two panelists. And if the difference is above a certain level, which is uh, actually part of the EN standard, we use the same. So if they're above, uh, I think, 57% uh, difference between the two, we can say to repeat that, uh, that experiment because one of them was not agreeing. I think I have a... So they do this campaign and um, they go through and they fill out day by day. So this is the bottom square is one day. And in that day, for example, there was let's say column one in A1, which is the top left node, they had 2% uh, for the VDI. So it was only 2% uh, of the time he detected. According to VDI, that's not an episode. That's nothing. And they measured two other units, which is basically like measured nothing as well. On another day, they had a 90%. So most of the time, they could smell that factory. And they measured 140 other units. So we have this for all the nodes, and you can see that big, uh, big table filled out. So what we can do with this data? First, we can develop the odor load. And what we mean is the total odor the poor neighbors are subjected to, not just from this factory, but in total, what's happening. How do we do this? We take an average for each node of all the odors that are there regardless of if it was considered to be from factory or not. And we average it out, and you can see, for example, in this, in this uh, scenario, the odor loads are more uh, stronger as you get closer to the factory, and they're weaker as you go away from the factory in the corners. But there are some other things you can tell from this, and, uh, and I'll go over those in a bit. For example, for example in the southwest side, there is a high odor load. But if you look at the wind, the wind is going towards the northwest. Uh, so it's kind of a little bit strange why we have such a high load here. So another thing we can determine. We can now determine the 98 percentile. Remember, we didn't do any dispersion calculation. This is just analyzing the data we got. So we can also calculate a 98 percentile. Now, this calculation is not on all the readings we took. It's only if when the VDI guy was standing there, if he had more than 10% reading, we count that odor concentration. If he didn't, we set it to zero. So basically, we're trying to filter out any odors that were not associated with that plant. And we can draw some graph like this. 
And uh, this is actually a case study. I should have probably said that. <laughs> it's a case study of a refinery. So at the top corner, it's uh, 100 and 138 older units. So when we had the older load, it was very low. But when we look at this graph, we see, OK, there is uh, something up in there. The 98 percentile for that square is really high. It's considerably higher than whatever is close by. When we look at the time of the events, when we went out there and look at the plant log, we see, oh, there was flaring at that time. So when the flare happened, it didn't come down fast enough. So the orders that are close to the boundary are not that high. But the ones that are further away, they're affected. Our grid didn't go far enough, but perhaps if it went one kilometer away, it might have even been higher. Um, now, another thing we can do, actually the title is not right, um, what we can do is determine if we put a limit, um, let's say seven order units. Now, I'm not saying this should be part of a regulation, but just to see how often they exceed some limit. 15 order units, 20 order units, whatever you want. If we put some limit, we can also determine how many hours per year or how many times from our, uh, our measurements they exceeded that limit. So we can say, okay, let's put 10. And we see, I think, 7 actually here. And we see they exceeded it a lot. So putting a limit of 7 order units as measured in the field would obviously not really work here, or they would really need to clean up because it, they are exceeding it quite often. Another thing we can do, we can compare two different types of uh, graphs. For example, we now look at the VDI and we look at the older load. And we say, how come in the bottom left corner, the older hours are very little? So the guys went there and they didn't detect the plant order. But when we look at the older load, it's a lot. It's more than any other square. So when in this case, when we looked around, there was a pump station there that was contributing to this to this order load. So we can find, identify some sources that are not perhaps identified at the beginning, saying something else is adding here, and OK, it's a pump station. That's why the order load is higher here, but it's not associated with our refinery. So yeah, conclusion. OK. <laughs> so in conclusion, um, this method is well suited for some situation. Of course, you need a long period. We, six months, I think it's a lot. I don't necessarily agree that it should be six continuous months. You can break it down into saying it's going to be three weeks repeated every season. So it's going to be like 12 weeks instead of full six continuous months. But it's anyway going to be more expensive than doing source testing. So for a wastewater treatment plant, would you need to do this? I don't know. I, I don't think so very easily that you would, unless you have cheap resource for doing this. But for a refinery, for landfill, for some difficult cases, this provides a solution that mitigates some of those problems we see with dispersion modeling and source testing. But the source testing, even for a refinery, once you identify some sources, it's still very useful because it can tell you which sources are the primary things you have to deal with once you want to do the mitigation. They just might not tell you from modeling what's the total order impact of that refinery. Thank you very much. Thank you. There are many questions. Maybe if you just yell it out, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Um, yeah, good presentation, Devon. Thank um, you. <laughs> just one thing. You said one moment that the SM100 will complement uh, the approach or the VDI approach yeah. in giving a little bit more information of the uh, FIDOL the FIDOL uh, parameters, yes. um, where you are measuring some loads, some order units, 
uh, yeah. that is not part of the file at all. So it's why I don't, I don't understand how you, you complement the VDI with having some FIDOL findings where you're measuring some other units and other units is not, there's no concentration in FIDOL. You have frequency, you have intensity, you have, you see yeah, what I mean? Uh, yes, yes, yes. So in the FIDOL, it says intensity, offensiveness, and things like this. Mm -hmm. But to give some measurements, what we did in this case was, for example, we say another one can be hedonic tone and concentration. Hedonic tone and concentration together can give you that intensity and offensiveness. If we know that this odor has hedonic tone minus 3 when it's uh, concentration 10 or 15 or 20, we can tell that the limit is going to be around 20. This is how we determine that it's going to be offensive. So to say that, yeah, you need to take intensity measurement, intensity is not really a measurable criteria you can go there and make a minus five to five but it's too subjective hedonic tone at least it's something that we have a procedure how to measure in a lab and once we have the, the order as a hedonic tone and you can do that in the field as well then you can correlate the concentration to what the perception of that order will be mm -hmm. okay uh, i'm not sharing completely your point of view in but intensity because i think you can do something quite representative and, and reproducible with intensity I, I so yeah i think we've had the we've had this debate Discussion a few already. times yeah, in the yeah, years okay. but no <laughs> i i don't agree you know the problem is that the intensity in my opinion can change even from the morning to the night on what you're subjected to you know if you ask me in the morning to go out and do perhaps i'm more tolerable than in the evening i'm going to be like minus five minus five so i in my opinion, a ranking, just like I think Professor Jim Nysel was saying, how much does this hurt? I don't know, shoot me once, and then the next time I'm going to say, no, it doesn't hurt. Like, your scale changes based on your experience. So just to say a minus two today, minus three tomorrow, I personally don't mm -hmm. think that's a way to go. Uh, yeah, I think the scale you're speaking about is more the endonic, endonic one. Because intensity is between zero to six, you don't have some minus two, so it's uh, intensity. Yes, you're right, yeah. zero to six, but then you need offensiveness, so another one. Yeah, but it's where when you deal some with the intensity, normally you deal with intensity of offensiveness is something else. Means when you are in the field, you deal with intensity. You smell rose, or you smell you smell some refinery. You smell at level three, whatever yeah. whatever the order is. But is the right? level is like distinct, strong. What is strong? What is distinct? What, it, like you can say, I smell it and I recognize it. But then after that, like the first two might be, but then the last ones is the ones that I'm saying. And, and what I was mostly mm. referring to was the offensiveness yeah, part, because intensity has no offense. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. We can, we can, you can set up a scale or in, in, in internal scale to, to set up with your panelists before measuring and to say you are this level, with a weak level, distinct and strong at these three levels. and, and it, it works. Yeah, it works I, well. I've seen some, even yeah. I've seen some N-butanol, uh, like that they yeah. compare to N-butanol a few times uh, and then stuff. Yeah. I haven't seen it nicely used or used properly yet, but maybe you're right. Maybe mm -hmm. somebody can, can do that intensity somehow. Just another point about the 10% or the hour, uh, from our experience, is something that may work, this, this value may work in Germany, because I think this value comes from some uh, quite extensive surveys carried out in Westphalia in Germany. This Westphalia area is 400 kilometers inland, where there are some very low winds and so on. And so the 10% is something that can work. Now, in Western Australia, when you are working on the coastal area, uh, we don't have these patterns of winds. And maybe the 10% is not the criteria you need to take. So just to say that when you discuss about this criteria, just be critical and be critical on this one in regards to where you are and see if it, you can apply that directly from Germany to your area. Because uh, I accept that the 10% is, I think, also really low. I wouldn't agree on the 10% as well. Uh, here, at least, I think it would last longer if you have an episode. Um, but the reason why we presented it like that is because the VDI is already accepted in many places like Chile, like Italy, like places like this and you even get ISO certification on it. So to say that, no, I'm gonna do 20%, it's not gonna be possible for them. For Australia, you can do whatever you want, 20%, 30%. But for them, they have to follow that. They can add to it and put into their proposal that we're also gonna do other concentration and nobody can say, 
why are you doing that? Because they're just getting extra information. But if they change 10 to 20, now their ISO certification is not valid. And you cannot use it in court in Germany, for example, because right. it's not <clears throat> part of that standard, right? No, so I, we're following that standard as much as we can. Right? No, I understand that, but just be aware where the 10% comes and, and just to be critical about this data and you're, you're not, not to use that as it is without any consideration about the source. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thanks. There was another question in the back or not? Other questions? No other? So, uh, thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, all speakers of the session.